I think the whole world is upside down right now. We see that in all facets of life, all things that are happening. It's point either your point A or your point Z. There's no middle ground and you can't feel one way or the other. You either have to believe this or you have to believe that. So people are losing the discernment and finding where they belong. And in religion, they want to control you in some way. And in spirituality, they want to control the way you think in some way. And so we have the liberty of free will to find the balance between both. Um, with one, the other doesn't exist. Um, without God, in my opinion, nothing in this world exists. Patricia, thank you so much for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. I'm excited to speak with you, kind of like similar to what we were discussing before we started recording the show, is that I really appreciate your work in merging spirituality with religion. Um, obviously, you're a medium, you're a spiritual teacher, you're also a trans medium, and you're also very passionate about talking about the teachings of Jesus. You wrote a whole book on it and your Catholic upbringing. So I want to start there. I want to start with your journey in first realizing that you were a medium, which my understanding of mediumship is talking to people who've crossed over to the other side. What was that experience like for you realizing that? What was that journey? And how did you decide to eventually become a spiritual teacher? Okay. So one thing I want to address first is mediumship, right? I look at mediumship as being multifaceted because, um, the medium not only communicates with those who have crossed over, they also communicate with the guides and teachers, which access information on a soul level. So that's where it's multi-defense, multifaceted, and I allow two worlds to collide, and that's where they merge, right? So when I was um, eight years old, I was in my bedroom, and um, I was I was woken up and there was the whole room was illuminated in this indigo light. And so um, I looked around and I could see my sister sleeping. I could see the perfume on the dresser. I could see the dresser mirror. And when I scanned the room in front of me was a coffin and it was highlighted the edges with that bright um, indigo light. And as I, my eyes locked on the coffin, the coffin door opened and I looked inside and I could see my grandmother in there and she had, I was only two and a half when she had passed away. So I see her sitting in there and then I sat up in my bed and when she, I sat up in my bed, she sat up in her coffin and she stretched her arms out to me and seven white crosses flew into my chest and they went bam, bam, bam. And it felt like it was in slow motion, but it was at the speed of light at the same time. I screamed out loud. My sister didn't wake up and I boogied out of the room and I went into my mom's room and I was scared. And my mom says, go back to bed. That was just a dream. And I'm thinking, I'm not going back in that room. <laughs> there was no way I'm going back into that room. So I went back in that room. And that was when I knew there was something different about me. And it was shortly after that, I was able to predict the weather. So I would tell the neighbors we were going to get certain strange weather. And when I would open my mouth, they would say, don't say that no more because you're predicting the weather. And we don't want 10 inches of snow. We don't need 12 inches of snow. We don't need three days of rain. And um, that's when I began to be interested in things like astrology. And, you know, by the age of 16, I'm watching all the psychics on TV. And at 18, I sat with my first psychic reader, who my friend told me I had to go to. And she never told me I was a medium or anything like that. But when I left that reading, I knew I had looked into the mirrored reflection of somebody's eyes that were just like me. And when I sat in my car... I said, I'm supposed to do this on some level. And that's how it all started for me. And that's when I started reading every book I could find and, and opening up every door until I found my teacher at the age of 28, my uh, mentor for 26 years. Very fascinating story. I can't imagine seeing that at eight years old. Um, <laughs> I would freak out. And <laughs> as you rightfully did, and you ran to your mother's room, but that is that is so huge. You've been tapped in for, you know, such a long time. And people usually say that um, children are a lot more sensitive to their psychic abilities. And typically as people grow up, they tend to shut that down. But I'm happy to know and hear that you actually didn't shut that down or shy away from it. And you actually sought knowledge and kind of embraced your gifts. Um, you also say something to that you said that um, being baptized and raised a Catholic set up the foundation of your spiritual alignment. So could you elaborate on how being raised Catholic set you up for 
um, your conditions of spiritual alignment, because typically that would set most people back because they would be told that what they were tapping into wasn't actually good. Well, we never really discussed much of psychic things. The well, only thing we discussed was I had a great grandmother and she was a healer. I have a story about that, which will blow your mind, but she was a healer and she was the one that we heard about and she was from Italy and people would secretly go to her and she would take them in her house and she would take on what they had and then they would walk away healed. So she would take on. So that was the only thing that I knew about any type of spirituality outside of the confines of the church because my mom was Catholic and my dad was raised in the church but he didn't follow a church practice so she was the one who was important for us to be baptized and um, do our confirmation in the Catholic church so I was raised in the Catholic church but I knew I would sit in mass and I was bored and I would listen to the preacher tell me this is what the word means and if you don't do this and um, you have to follow it this way. And so he was giving his opinion, but saying it was the truth of what he was reading instead of allowing people to discern what the reading really meant. So by the time I was 13 years old, I knew the church wasn't for me anymore. And when I made my confirmation, I told my mom I wasn't going back to church. So I did the confirmation and I did all of those things and I moved away from the church um, by the time I was 15. And um, I just started on my path of um, being in tune with nature and um, recognizing and understanding that I had this intuitive voice speaking and nudging me in different directions. It wasn't like some people say, oh, I had dead people showing up all around me. You know, for me, that wasn't my experience. My experience was more of God nudging me, God pushing me forward, God's voice speaking to me. God's voice giving me warnings of things that were going to happen and they would come to pass. So that's how it was for me. And so I look at that um, first 13 to 15 years of my life as the building blocks and the foundation of understanding and recognizing the importance of God within my life and building that relationship with Christ and the church. And I've carried it with me to this day. And now I'm going to cry. <laughs> No, don't cry. So if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, from what it sounds like is you knew on an intuitive level when you used to go to church, what as a child and as a teenager that a lot of the teachings or a lot of the interpretation of the word was coming from someone's opinion and that opinion was really not aligning with you and it seems that as you were you continued on this path, you didn't stay away from God. You 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 took some time away from the church, but you actually worked on cultivating your personal relationship with God and that personal relationship with God helped you to hone in on your skills and embrace your gifts and 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 work with the gifts that he's given you is that correct yeah that's correct and you know and so I always say Jesus is the tangible form of God and the reason why Jesus came to the earth and why God sent Jesus to the earth is so that we could have the tangible form of God because people um, who don't believe, like say people who don't believe a God or don't think that there's a God, it's because they can't touch him, see him, feel him because their faith doesn't, they don't have the faith and that building block to understand that we can believe something that we can't see and we know it to be real. And so Jesus becomes that tangible expression of God in the flesh. So that's why I'm so passionate about Jesus. But yes, exactly what you said. <laughs> yeah, this is very interesting because now I want to ask you, so what is your full understanding of Jesus? I know that you just talked about it, right? And I think I, I grew up Catholic as well. And the understanding that I have of Jesus Christ is that he is the only son of God. He is God to some extent. But I've also heard people say that Jesus was here to show us how to connect to God and we all have God within us. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that we cannot, not trying to compare, I'm not trying to say that we are comparable to Jesus Christ, but what I'm trying to ask is that him being the only son of God, is that something that you believe? And do you believe that we all have God within us and we can all kind of be representative of God's light? All of those things that you said are true. Every single piece of what you said is true, but there was different things that people cherry picked out. And so people would cherry pick out one thing about Christ, another thing about Christ. But if you connect all the things that you just said, that's God in a nutshell. <laughs> that's God. That's that, you know, 
um, that's where we open up and the yolk is. And so we get to consume of the yolk. And so we get to eat of the, you know, the fruit of the fruit of the world, the fruit of the lamb, the fruit of God. And so Jesus is so many things to so many different people. And he's connected to every religion that exists in the world. Nobody can claim them as his own, but he's touched every facet of every religion. And he's in every single religious book and scripture that you can find across the world. So he's touched, God sent Jesus to the world to show us the way and the way was back to God. And so the way back to God was through Jesus Christ, which we call the Lamb of God. And so being raised as a Catholic as you were, I embrace my Catholic religion because if it wasn't for my mom and her influence and, and having me sit in all of those masses and listen to all of that scripture, I'm not sure that I would have the intimate connection and relationship with God that I have today because it became that foundation underneath my feet where I was able to build upon. So just like a house, we have to have a solid foundation and structure. And that's what the Catholic church did for me. Now, um, all of us are going to be filled with opinions. You know, I have my opinion. And so what I share as my truth becomes a form of my opinion. And what you share as your truth becomes a form of your opinion. But the threads of Jesus Christ are connected to all of us. And so when we allow those threads to be connected from you to me to the next person, that's where the truth grows. And what we've shared, if we find it tangible and resonating within us, we begin to share the truth and the teachings of others. And that's what Jesus did. And so he shared those threads of who he was. And through his disciples, it spread and his apostles spread across this earth. And that's why now we find ourselves in a time where the teachings of Jesus are never more important than they are right now, because so many people are disconnected from God and source and energy and more connected to AI and those type of things. And that's becoming the influence and the disconnect in the world and why Jesus, the teachings of Jesus today are so very important. I hope I answered your question. No, what you did, you did. I, you know, obviously I'm letting you finish. You know, I want you to get all your thoughts out. You absolutely answered all of my questions. And as you were talking, I was thinking about a thousand other questions to ask you because <laughs> I think that Jesus's teachings seem straightforward, but they're not straightforward to a lot of people. I think within Christianity, there's so many different factions, so many different denominations and interpretations of Jesus's teachings. And, you know, and how passionate you're speaking about this, but you also talked about going into astrology. You're also a medium, again, you're a spiritual teacher. And I was just listening to a podcast the other day because I was curious and the host had someone on the show who used to be into astrology and they did work as a medium and they completely did a complete 360 and decided to find their way back to the church, find their way back to God because they felt like astrology was super evil. Mediumship was evil, that people were connecting with uh, low vibrational entities, what they would consider to be the devil. So again, the question I really want to ask you is what would you say to people who consider things like astrology or the the gift of mediumship that you have, the, the gift, your psychic abilities, what would you say to people who might consider that as you connecting with demonic entities? Because people say that you can't practice those things and then also talk about Jesus Christ, that that's, those two things don't go hand in hand. What would you say to people who have that belief system? Um, okay, so we're all fed, right? So um, let's start here. Um, where we come from or how we utilize our gifts or how we push them forward, um, the way that I share them, I share them as a way that um, we're going to access information that's going to benefit you at this time of your life. So um, that's a tough question. <laughs> How do you answer it? Um, I personally noticed over the last couple of years, all of the things that you're saying, there's tons of people coming out in this way. But I've also noticed that the people that are coming out in this way are still building off of the audiences that followed them when they were doing their practices. Now, I've always devoted my life to God. 
where did those people, where were they devoting their life to? I've never worshiped anything other than God. I've never placed a God before God. I've never said, you know, um, the God of this or the God of that. We have one God, one source of light. Um, and that's where I've always connected to and done any of my work. Before I do any of my work, I always pray myself in. So as far as the devil being in, in the details, I think that the devil can be in the details in anything in life if we allow the devil to be in the details. Um, but the way that we practice or the information that we share and the influence that we leave upon another person, we have to be very mindful of it because there's ethics and principles and discipline. And we have to realize that we're influencing another person's life. And through my gift of mediumship, um, I want to help people to discern and find their own way, but it's always through recognizing the essence of the God light within them that guides them forward to do those things. So when people say demonic things or those type of things, sometimes I believe they're probably practicing it and it's probably something coming up within their energy that they're trying to write as being a wrong. Um, but there are a lot of people and I don't want to call them I know I can't, <laughs> you guys are funny. <laughs> They're talking to me now. <laughs> I'll just use the word Bible thumpers, okay? Where they take everything within the Bible and use it so literally. So we have to remember when we read something, we need to discern what it is that we're reading. All of the apostles were prophets. All of the apostles were prophetic. They all channeled information from God source and they called it God source and energy. Um, but I think that we've all gotten so far away of utilizing words like entities and um, spirit guides and teachers and all of these things. But in the spirit world, um, there are other beings of light, higher vibrational beings that come in to influence and teach us and carry us forward. As far as demonic for me, I've never practiced demonic. I've um, rebuked the devil. And so anything that I do comes from a source or a place of God, but I can't speak to everybody else. But there are some big professionals right now that are utilizing that platform to build a new platform for themselves. And I say to myself, where is the devil in the details in that? Because now they're speaking against other people because of something that they've done for themselves and so they've lumped everybody into one you know one ball of wax when um just because we have one bad apple it can spoil the whole bunch does that make sense <laughs> it makes a lot of sense actually and just from listening to those people talk about their experience I think that everything at the end of the day you know is energy and I think we are spiritual beings having a human experience I think that when we're trying to connect with God or different entities, I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that we're opening it, opening ourselves up. And I think it takes a certain level of intentionality and awareness to understand that if you're opening yourself up and you're trying to channel something, you could potentially attract different vibrational entities, right? So you could attract, for example, the light of God and resonate with that. But also sometimes I do think people might unintentionally attract lower vibrational entities. At least this is my analysis from listening to these different people and having those experiences where they're no longer, they're probably having more negative energetic reactions to the work that they're doing probably forces them back to you know, being Bible thumpers, like you said, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think also that type of rhetoric where people take the Bible so literally and try to use it, unfortunately, whether intentional or unintentional to oppress people or to, to imbue shame or fear in people. I think that, um, again, like you said, we have to think about the devil in the details when it comes to that as well. I think people are so extreme on either end. And I think that there's a middle point where we can bridge the, bridge different practices together. And it just depends on the person who's using a specific modality, right? So there's some people who might be using astrology. They have good intentions. They're connecting to God's source and it's, you know, good energy. It's pure. And then there are other people who may not have the same level of intentionality and might be attracting negative 
entities through that work. Again, I'm just, this is my hypothesis. <laughs> this is my hypothesis so far, still working on it, but that's what I've kind of picked up um, with a lot of these conversations I've been hearing about quote unquote, new age folks coming back to Jesus Christ and giving their life to Jesus Christ and completely denouncing every other sort of practice like astrology, mediumship, psychic abilities, et cetera. Right. And so um, what were their, exactly what were their modalities or practices and what is it that they're trying to um, make right within themselves? So then at one point in their life, they were 100% in this area of their life. And now all of a sudden they're 100% in this other area of their life. And so they have no balance. And so there's no balance between um, where they came from and where they've gone. Like you said, it's an extreme. They go from point A all the way to point Z and they don't experience any of the other letters in the alphabet along the way. It can only be one way or the other. And so that's how they've been operating. And so their lesson in all of this is where do they find the balance in um, what they're saying, what they're seeing, what they're believing. And there's going to be people that are going to resonate with what they have to say because they're on the same level of awareness that that they are at. They have to find a balance in the middle of all of that to see where I can, what I'm feeling is a sin I need to atone for. How do I atone for the sin, but recognize the validity in the voice of of God moving through somebody that might call themselves a medium instead of saying that person is the devil because they're calling themselves a medium. And so it's like labels, right? And people are all about, well, you can't, I don't like labels and you shouldn't label people. Well, now we have the extremist and they're labeling. So I think the whole world is upside down right now. We see that in all facets of life, all things that are happening. It's point either your point A or your point Z. There's no middle ground and you can't feel one way or the other. You either have to believe this or you have to believe that. So people are losing the discernment and finding where they belong. In. And they're actually showing me, you know, those things, I don't know what they're called, but they go like this. And then, and it's, it's got, and then it moves back and forth and then it finds a place of balance in the middle. So people have to really find where, you know, even if they had to meditate on that or focus on that and see where the balance comes into the middle to help them to recognize their truth. Because like one thing where people might be teaching, for example, this came to mind when you were speaking, um, people will come, have come to me for readings and I'm like, um, you're you got a bra full of crystals and they're like, how do you know that? I said, well, the spirit world is telling me so. And I said, take, I said, you shouldn't worship those crystals. Those, maybe there's some energy that's around those crystals to teach you something. Learn from why that crystal appeared in your life, but don't carry it on your body to change the circumstances of what you want to change because you're looking for a crystal to do the work of yourself. So you're worshiping this crystal and wanting this crystal to do something for you instead of allowing the God, God source within you to help recognize why did this crystal appear to me? What energetic information does it have to teach me? And what is my life lesson around this that I need to change that this crystal has appeared or invoking me to do so? So that's like working with the natural world for, for an example. And it doesn't make the idea of um, having a crystal for information um, as a bad thing, but it's what you do with that crystal. Do you use that crystal as a teacher or do you use that crystal as a crutch? And so we have those type of things which came to mind when you were speaking. And so I wanted to share that because they were bringing it forward um, very strongly to put it out there as an example. So where we have the simplicity of people recognizing you know, this modality, this crystal and, and, and what elements are tied to the crystal. Um, but how do we utilize that crystal to benefit us in life instead of utilizing it as a quote unquote, a God for ourselves? Does that make I, sense? Yeah, it does. It makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting that you are bringing this up because I was having this thought, I think yesterday or two days ago, the idea of crystals. I think the podcast I, I listened to prompted that. And a lot of people who again, have been on the extreme end of quote unquote, the new age, because that's what people call it. 
have, they talk about using crystals and, and all of that stuff. And I remember thinking to myself that, you know, I've come across crystals as well, but there's this energy to it that makes you feel like this thing outside of you is the one either bringing luck to you, bringing wisdom to you or protecting you. And I do think that that mindset for me personally, I came to the realization that that is again, putting my power externally and disconnecting from God, in my opinion, in, in, in my own personal, um, understanding, right. And intuitive knowing. So it's interesting that you're bringing that up as well, that, you know, what is the purpose of using these different ob objects? And do you find yourself kind of worshiping those things? And it, it also wants, it also prompts me to ask you the question about your thoughts on witchcraft, because some people call themselves witches. And I do actually want to have a conversation with someone like that on the show. And people talk about the fact that when it comes to witchcraft, it's not necessarily evil. It's, you know, playing with natural elements and tapping into intuitive abilities. And then some other people consider it to be evil. Again, I just want to hear your thoughts on the notion of witchcraft and, and people who identify as witches. Okay. Um, I know you asked me one thing before too, and I didn't answer it. Whenever I do my work also, I call upon the pure Christ light of perfect love and protection to surround and protect me, fill every part of my being and my soul as I do any type of work or even walk through my day. And I ask for that protection around me all the time. And so I know that the essence of Christ is filling me and protecting me and guiding me. And um, as far as the witchcraft thing goes, when we have people, this is just my, my feeling on it. Um, creating spells to make things happen. They're utilizing um, people's fears and then they're utilizing people's weaknesses to get them to um, create things like, um, for example, I had a girl who came to me and she used to sit in my circle and she came and she disappeared and I was wondering, and I had gotten this heart and it was selen a selenite heart. So it was a crystal. I'm like, I don't know why I have this. And it, and I knew I needed to sit it on my table. Well, she showed up and I looked at her and, um, she had been working with someone dealing in witchcraft and she said that there was a spell around her and the witch made her believe there was a spell and she had to do stuff with all of these black candles and stuff and I and and um and she had to bring the lady steaks and cigarettes as payment and and, and she was buying into everything that the woman was telling her so what does witchcraft kind of do so, um there's a lot of people who would, it, it preys on those who are fearful and may not have the discernment to think for themselves and think that they need somebody else to live and guide their life. Um, and I think when we're invoking that stuff and we're using spell casting to change things, we're putting out into the world as we're casting spells on other people, um, a power that are an energy that is not conducive or beneficial to the person doing it, nor um, on the other end, sometimes the person that's receiving it with the with the energy. So that's why it's important to always invoke that Christ light. I don't believe we should be casting spells. Um, that's just my belief. That's how I feel. I would never cast a spell on another person. Um, and I think that um, that is where you'll find the devil in the details, if that makes sense. So witchcraft is, um, they, you know, they bind and they do strange things. And um, it's not something that um, I'm fond of. Even Wiccan, they try to say Wiccan is working with the natural world, but they're still using spells and binding and stuff to change the energy, for instance, between somebody that they want to love them. So they make a love spell. You can't make somebody else love you from a love spell. And if you do, how long is that love going to last? That love isn't real. That love was created out of something that you want to call as black magic. And so unless you break that black magic spell you're going to carry that energy around with you and create more of the same thing so what are we creating lack of love how do i get it i have to trick somebody into loving me by casting a spell upon them so where do how do we break that spell or what do we do instead of going to witchcraft to do it 
first learn how to love yourself and love yourself as God loves you. And when you realize that you're lovable and you remove those things within your mind, um, for instance, that make you feel unlovable and you start using affirmations like I am lovable, I am loved or whatever it is that you have to do to see yourself as loved and you remove that, um, the impressions of somebody else that might've told you throughout your life, nobody will ever love you. You're this, you're that, you'll never be loved. When you remove those and realize that you are, you change the energy within yourself and then you draw that love to you instead of trying to create a spell based on what you desire, yet you haven't fixed what's inside of you to bring that energy to you. <laughs> I know I probably went off on a tangent That there. was great. No, you're answering all these questions so well. You're not going off on a tangent. I'm 100% following <laughs> your thought okay. process. So thank you for, you know, shedding light on that and, and giving your thoughts on that. Because I always feel like skeptical about the whole notion of witchcraft and that being okay, only because of how I grew up. So I'm Nigerian. So in my culture, we think of witchcraft as juju and juju is only seen to be evil. Do I think that people use witchcraft or do good spells? I, I, I think there's a possibility that that's a thing, right? Because not, I don't live in an extreme world, but I think it's the calling of it that I, I still try to wrap my head around it. And I do want to talk to someone who is in that space to get additional insight. But I think everything that you said makes a whole lot of sense and I think is to some degree very spot on. Um, so it also makes me want to ask, because I know you talked about protection, right? And I know mm -hmm. a lot of people who do your work, I always ask the question, so how do you protect yourself? How do you receive your messages? Because again, they're different entities at different levels, light, dark, et cetera. So it just, you talked about you protecting yourself. So I want to know, um, one, do you believe in the devil, right? Because that's a big thing that comes up in Christianity. And the other thing I want to ask is, what is the significance of protection? I know that might seem obvious, but I, I still want to ask that question. Okay. So first off, I always want to say we're all in charge of ourselves. So whenever we do anything, if we think we're going to draw on the negative, then we're focusing on the negative and we're going to allow it to open a door for that negative. If we we put um, boundaries in place and say, this is the energy that I want to work with, and that's the energy that we work with. So we're all in charge of ourselves. No one can commandeer our free will, not even the spirit world. Um, it all comes from the human being within us. Do I believe the devil is real? Absolutely. I think the devil's in the details and a lot of this world and the things that we see happening. Let's use drugs for, for an example. How did, how does the devil deer commandeering all of these souls? They're utilizing drugs and they're separating them from their God essence, they're separating them from their family. And what are they loving? They're only loving the drug until there's the demise of themselves. So drugs, I believe, is one aspect of where the devil has his hand in this world and where he is trying to um, create his his empire. And so he's done so um, based on when they've got the love of drugs the only thing that they're caring about is how am I going to get my next hit or how am I going to get my next bag or how am I going to score my next bit of dope? Um, and they don't care what they have to do to, to do it. So I believe the devil's very much in the details, but there's always a lesson revolving around that. And it's not that God can't get back to that person. It's that that person has to break the spell that the devil has over them. Okay. Um, as far as my protection, I learned years ago when I started reading books, the importance of creating a bubble of light around, around yourself. I didn't learn it in the church, but I started reading books and then I, and then I met Jackie and then, um, you know, I got a, a deeper understanding, but it's just creating this light of God around myself, um, around my home, around my family, around my vehicles that, um, 
that I know I'm drawing in that God light. So as far as the protection, I'm really asking God to draw close to me and to keep me safe. But we use it as a form of white light so that it becomes tangible. Because remember when I talked about Jesus in the flesh is God, the tangible God that we can touch and realize that he's real. The same thing, we need to use that visualization to understand that protection that we're calling to us. And I always call that for that Christ light because it's the highest light that can protect us through all things. And I pray it for my family. I mean, I'll even give you a story. I, I used to pray it every day. I was a construction worker for 35 years and I was driving my car and my husband had just gotten the new car. So he drove the new car and I'm like, I better call Larry up because he's going to hit a deer. And I'm like, no, nah, that's crazy. He's not going to hit a deer. And I didn't pray for his car. Five minutes later, well, maybe 10, 10 minutes later, my phone rings. I'm like, what's going on? He goes, oh my God, you're never going to believe this. This deer came across the street and hit the one lady's car, bounced off of my car. It caused a three car accident. I'm like, oh my God, I was going to call you five or 10 minutes ago because I knew this deer was going to appear there. So it's just like those type of things. I didn't pray for, I didn't get to pray for his car like I always did. I knew that there was a danger and I didn't follow through. Not that this has anything to do with the story, but it's that white light I call and I ask to protect my my house and my home and my family as we are in our travels and and on any visitors we may have and our pets and I just I just am calling the essence of God to be present so that's how I view protection <laughs> thank you for answering that and as a medium and you're also a trans medium I wanted to ask what does it mean to be a trans medium a trans medium is this so a trans medium is different than than regular mediumship. And um, it's nothing that people should be taking um, lightly or saying, I'm going to go and just all of a sudden I'm a medium. So I'm now going to practice trans medium. Um, trans mediumship is a relationship you have with the spirit world. And what happens is, is the medium I go into like a, a state of hibernation. And so I pray myself in and I always pray myself in with the Our Father. And so I pray myself in and I begin to quiet my mind and my, all of the, um, my blood pressure and my heart and all of the organs start to go into like a hibernative state. And then I allow the spirit world to blend their mind with my mind and they utilize my voice to present wisdom for that will that is for and will benefit our world. So I allow them to utilize my voice and my body to speak information from the spirit world into this world for those who are sitting in the seance room so that they are getting fed from um, this highest wisdom that I can draw into my body. But I am not a part of it, but they utilize my mind and my voice, which they'll change at times to speak to those in the seance room and they speak to things that are happening in the world. So that's trans mediumship. Is that different from channeling? That sounds very similar to. Uh, it's well, channeling can be done on a con in a conscious way. Okay. So it's like, it's like channeling, but it's a bit different because the medium completely surrenders to the spirit world where the spirit world utilizes the medium's body. And so I've also been told that they do so because they fill the room with healing energy. And so I've always been told that I was a healer. And so this is one way that they've found that they can utilize me to put healing energy into the space because people will say after they're in the seance room that the energy was this beautiful energy that just came off of you and then people walked away feeling healed. And so it definitely, um, it definitely is uh, <laughs> uh, different. Um, it's not like regular mediumship. And so when you walk into the seance room, because I've had people say to me, when they heard what was going to happen, they asked themselves, oh my God, what am I doing here? Why am I sitting here? Oh my God, the devil's going to be here. So people have thought those things and they would come up to me afterwards and they would say, you have to understand, I wanted to walk out. I didn't want to be here. But once you started speaking and this energy came off of you, I knew why I needed to be here. And it was one of the most beautiful things that I've experienced. So <laughs> trans mediumship is definitely not sexy. <laughs> more intense. It's more intense. That's what I'm picking up. So as a, as a medium, as a trans medium, you're always connecting with the spirit world. What are your thoughts on the afterlife and this notion of reincarnation? 
I believe that the soul has lived more than one time. Um, I believe that, you know, we come here and, and look at us all. We're, we've done, we've all done things that we're not proud of. We all have skeletons in our closet. We all have things that we wish that we wouldn't have done, but we've learned something by them, right? And so the soul comes here and the soul is always housed in the place that it's supposed to be. And so what the soul is doing, looking for growth to realize perfection, because we had, you know, Adam and Eve and then the Garden of Eden and the devil finding its way in there and, and man running amok, right? And so the soul, every time it re reincarnates, it gets another opportunity to grow and, and build on that oneness with Christ and, and God until we realize our soul realizes that perfection. And I believe that it can take more than one lifetime to be able to do that because you, you know, if we really look around us, you know, um, we have good people and we have bad people. And so um, everybody's so different. And um, I don't believe that we just, I believe that there's a heaven and a hell, but I don't believe that we just go over there and um, we don't get the opportunity to atone for our misdeeds in a lifetime. Unless they were so egregious and our soul just doesn't want to move forward and then we're in that pit or we need to learn something from being in that pit so that we can bring it into this world and say, hey, listen, there is a hell and you really need to be mindful of what you're doing. And you need to atone for your sins and reconnect to that, that God, you know, reconnect to that oneness with God. But um, I do believe that we have multiple chances and opportunities to live other lifetimes. And so, yeah, I, I would say <laughs> that yeah. makes, you know, I, yeah. I don't know if people might us uh tie that to the devil but I don't yeah I don't tie that to the devil I don't even know I don't think of the devil as an entity I think of the devil as just lower vibrational energy that is part of this dimensional reality and we can decide to kind of allow ourselves to feed into fear control and all these other things or we can kind of evolve more into more good energy but I'm still trying to fully understand that because people do really think of the devil um, as a real entity and it's interesting that you said that you think that you believe that there's a hell because I've talked to several people and they're always like oh there isn't a hell if there was a hell it would be earth technically so do you what what do you really define as hell are you when you talk about hell are, are we are you talking about it in the sense of you're going to go and be with the devil and you're going to burn potentially for eternity or do you have a different understanding of hell I'm just curious when when you use that term what are you referring to you know, I used to feel like you did too, that earth is hell and all of these things. But I think too, um, probably as I was coming up in my spirituality, I was fed different things that maybe I wanted to latch onto because I was so afraid of hell. So if I just said earth was hell, then I didn't have to worry about burning in hell. <laughs> but I believe that um, it's a place where, you know, I believe Satan is a fallen angel, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him. And there's other fallen angels that have fallen with him. And I believe it's the playground where they take those who um, have not realized or called on his name, have not realized or recognized the importance of Jesus in their life have not realized or recognized the importance of their own, their own sense of God. And so, um, I believe it's both here and in another realm. So, um, I believe that we get the opportunity when we cross over to call on Jesus's name. But I believe that if we don't, I do believe that we go somewhere where it might be a little hot. <laughs> So I believe that it is a real place. Um, I don't believe that it was just written in the, if it was, if it was so that earth was hell, don't you think it would have been written and recognized in the Bible and it would have been talked about in the Bible and those type of things, even though the Bible was changed so many different times, there's never a reference that says earth is hell because then everybody would be living a miserable ex existence. Don't you think? That's a good point. I mean, for me personally, the the notion of hell, I mean, there's I can't prove it, but the notion of hell to me sometimes feels like a method of 
getting people to stay in a fear-based state and work towards perfection that is unattainable as a human being, in my opinion. So that's the part that I'm always like, is there actually a hell or is it more of, because to the point of reincarnation, right? If we're going to come back and do this over and over again, then what is the point of going to hell if we have to still come back and learn to do better potentially, right? So that's that's the that's the part of my brain that I'm like, is this a fear tactic to get people to fall in line? And and when people talk about calling on the name of Jesus Christ, they think about other people in different religions, right? Like Muslims um, and other religions around the world who acknowledge Jesus Christ, but that's not who they would potentially call on. So are those people damned? You know, the, that those no. are the questions that come up in my mind. I don't think that they're damned. I, but I believe that there's, I believe that it's Jesus Christ is our salvation. And so he's with us through the storm and he's with us on our best days. But most importantly, he's our salvation as we walk through and upon this earthly soldier, right? And so just to understand and recognize the power of Christ um, is important. And I believe that when we cross over. If there, if we have somebody in a religion that just believes that there's a God, they're still believing in that oneness with God. But I also believe that Jesus, when Jesus says to get to the father, you, you need to go through the son. Um, there's an importance in that. Um, I believe, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to happen. And, um, I just think that people are going to be surprised. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, and I th Mm -hmm. I think it's just a coming back to it's coming back to Christ for the people who didn't hear what he had to say when he was here over 2000 years ago. We're having the opportunity to hear his word spoken again. And how do we atone to that word? You know, in those other religions, the word of Christ was cut out of the Bible and or their Quran or whatever it was. And why is that for control of the religious orders, the religious orders to control the masses? And people within those religious orders or the orders where Christ might not be talked about in this way are the ones that have moved away from it and they've created that secret underground of Christians. And those are the, those are the people that are being persecuted in other countries because the religious order is not able to keep control of those people because they have broken away from their fearful tactics. Yeah, and to your point, I think that's why a lot of people run away from religion, though, because it gets kind of a little. Again, my mind is just still going back to the for the people who aren't Christians, they believe what they believe for the people who are atheists. And I think of God as a loving God. So to me, the notion to call on him, I think he wants us to know that we have access to him and he wants us to be connected to him. We are, he, we have him, we have God in us. I truly do believe that. But I also think that why do we need to, this is going to sound crazy, but just follow me. Why <laughs> do we need to acknowledge him? Because I think of it like this. We are, I think we're working to be the best versions of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the the requirement of acknowledgement to me sounds like a very human, ego-driven necessity. And when I think about God, I think that God is above that. God knows that he created us a certain way, gave us free will to explore and learn the way we want to learn. And I also believe that we're not the only beings in this universe. I think that there are other beings in different planets personally. So to me, the notion of having to acknowledge him in order to get to heaven or in order to get to the promised land, that means it leaves out billions of people who have other religions and, and strongly believe in those religions. So if God is the beginning and the end and he knows everything, then why be punished for something that you already know we're going to do? I don't 
think that God is punishing, like you said, you know, punishment was a Catholic word. God is going to punish you, you know, or God, you know, God is going to be angry with you and teaches that fear base of God. Um, have you ever noticed getting back to your point of the atheist, for example? Um, I have been told that everybody will call his name. But have you ever noticed that even an atheist will say, oh, my God, why did that happen? I mean, if you really listen to what they say, everybody references God, but for some reason they want to deny God. But what what is the masses or the people connected to the atheists learning about their own um, oneness or connection to God? And what is the atheist learning from that person whose devotion is to God or to Christ learning from that person? And how does it reawaken that oneness within them? Because in all actuality, they're separated from source. They're separated from that God essence um, or acknowledging it within them and want to make it a default to, oh, it's only science. And so if you ever notice, the atheists will also talk about, oh, it's only science. Uh, I mean, I've worked in... Um, in a center where the majority of people didn't believe in God, but I always spoke about God. And um, I even work and did platform work with another medium who doesn't believe in God, only believes in science. And she'll always, she'll always tease me. She's like, oh, that Patty, she just only believes in God. <laughs> but um, what are we learning from each other? W you know, what is the atheist to learn from the believer? And what is the believer to learn from the atheist? And so I believe that people are are put here for us to learn something about ourselves from them. And where is that mirrored reflection within the opposition of what we are that we are to either grow from, um, learn from, or even move away from. So I believe God put all people here and you hit the nail on the head because it's the free will of the human being that decides what we believe or what we don't believe. But I am a believer of once we cross that great divide, we are giving a view of something that maybe we never could have imagined or spoke of while we were on this earth plane. I don't believe that just because maybe you might spout off or I'm an atheist or I'm this and you cross that great divide that God's going to go, you get in the line over there. You didn't believe in me, but there could have been something that that person was to teach other people or learn on their own from that experience. I don't believe that God is going to persecute and send everyone to hell. I do believe we're given the opportunity to figure out when we cross that great divide, which line are we getting in? What, what line do we want to be in? Because our soul is infinite and it carries years and lifetimes worth of wisdom. But what lifetime did we bring back here with to announce that maybe we're atheists or we don't believe in God that is supposed to teach us something that we didn't learn maybe the lifetime or three lifetimes before? Because I believe everything that we experience, especially our hardest lessons, are connected to past lifetimes and we're given the opportunity to learn something about ourselves and elevate our soul growth in what we call the schoolhouse of earth because i believe that the earth is a schoolhouse and so we uh, this is the one of the greatest and most impactful places that we can learn as a soul whose desire and i believe all souls desire is to elevate our growth and become more united to that oneness with source or god this is what I believe. <laughs> Very interesting. Do you believe in um do you believe in aliens? Do you feel like we're the only beings in the planetary system or do you believe that there are other beings across different galaxies? Okay. <laughs> and I ask that only because I I I'm curious to know if that also plays into your understanding of God or if you or if you consider that in in terms of what you consider to be the nature of God, if that makes any sense. I, okay. I'm going to tell you a little 
tiny story. I'll try to make it fast. Um, no, take your time. I, I was newly married and I would meditate. And so, um, we lived in a split level. And so I would go up to the bedroom and tell my husband, Larry, and I'd set my cassette player. Cause it, we had cassette players back then. And I put my 30, 40 piece minute piece of music in there. And I let my candle say, don't bother me. I'm going to meditate. So I would go up there and I would begin to fall into my meditation and then out of nowhere I would hear what I want to call the locust and it would it would get louder you know what the sound of locust sounds like and it would be this buzz it would go this humming this buzzing it would be so loud and I would become paralyzed and the next thing I know I would see these flashing lights at my window and I would be struggling to to wake up and so this happened to me 13 times and then I would finally get out of it and I would run out of the bedroom and it, it was like time stood still because Larry's looking at me like, are you crazy? Um, I'm like, you have to come upstairs. The, the UFOs were here. And so he's like, are you out of your mind? And I didn't really like believe too much in UFOs. So shortly after that, years later, I had to have an operation. And when they were wheeling me into the operating room and I had never had an operation, there were big lights. And when I was being wheeled down this hallway with these big circle lights, I started seeing myself back on the spaceship and those visitations that they took me to. And then I got there and all of the nurses and doctors had masks on and and all I could see were their eyes and they were looking at me and I began crying big giant tears and I remember the doctor going put her under sit her up and they put me under and then I woke up I never had the visitation again but I do believe that yes is there were there aliens do they take people yeah I believe that something happened to me um in that window of time. And when I was in that operating room, it brought back the fear of whatever happened up there. Um, I can't tell you what it was, but do I believe they're real? Yes. <laughs> yes. And how does that, uh, how did, how do you think about that in relation to God and his plan for us? Because I always wonder, we have different religions on earth here. I wonder if they're different religions. I wonder if aliens also have religions, if they believe in Jesus Christ, did Jesus incarnate into on those planets? I, we might never have those answers, but I'm just curious to know that do you factor the notion of other beings and other different planets into God and what you believe to be his plan for us and finding our way back to him? You know, I don't know about that so much, but I believe that there's an intelligence. So I believe that there's probably good or bad. And because I was always such a scared little girl, I don't know what was happening, but I remember being paralyzed in fear those 13 times in that bedroom and hearing that buzzing and seeing those flashing lights and not being able to move. Um, I also believe that there could be some intelligence that they want to download into us to help us prosper this world. I believe that in other dimensions, just like here on earth, there's good and there's bad. And so it depends on how they want to influence us. So are there negative um aliens i have a friend that will tell you tell you some stories that would like your mind would explode are there some that are here to give us knowledge so that we can move forward into the world as it is i believe that happens too i also believe that the fear within us as human beings and what we've been fed and on to understand about these things plays a big part in our interaction with them. Would I call upon them to come and make their presence known and take me on their spaceship? No, because I don't have the desire for that. But do I think they exist? I, I mean, I've had, I'll have, I believe that they do exist because I know I've had an experience with it and um, there's something to be learned from it, but my mind or my memory of that time, maybe I'm just not ready to know what it is, but I do know that I know what I saw. I know what I experienced. And um, I think that there's good and evil in all dimensions and all realms. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you've given me so much to think about in this conversation, especially on the notion of, you know, calling on Christ. And I, I believe that God is in us. God is never apart from us. But I do think as human beings, we experience duality and we experience separation. And when we're not tapped into that God essence, 
we do feel separated from God, even though God is with us. But you've given me a lot to think about regarding the notion of of hell as an actual realm place and also the notion of calling on him and and what heaven and what the afterlife could potentially um what the afterlife going to heaven or hell could potentially be so that's that's really has my brain working um I honestly I have one more question because you said (laughs) something that sparked something in me and I'm like I can't believe I almost forgot to ask you this question so a lot of people um a lot of spiritual teachers will consider God an ascended master. They consider God an ascended master, um, the Buddha as an ascended master, and Muhammad, for example, as an ascended master. What are your thoughts on Jesus being an ascended master? Um, I I think I've referenced Jesus as an ascended master, but Jesus in all actuality, there's something in my book I wanted to read you real fast about that. Um, Please go ahead. There, uh, Jesus, I believe, is an ascended master, but he, I think he taught the um, the ch- because he was such a channel for God and people just seeing him as a man and not seeing him as a um, as God itself. We kind of put him in a box as an ascended master. Um, but was he an ascended master? Sure, he was an ascended master, but he is the essence of God in the flesh. And so there was one time I was sitting there, and I'm going to read this to you. Maybe it'll answer because you just referenced all, and I was looking at this and I'm like, I should read this to her earlier today. So enlightenment through the way encompasses spirituality. Buddha came to teach enlightenment. The Christ came to teach the way. The Tao was born of both aspects. One teaches how to navigate spirituality. One teaches how to navigate mankind. And the other teaches how to navigate the natural world. All applied together will teach you how to navigate the human existence through spirituality and where the human beings find themselves in the natural world today. Wow. That was was channeled. Yeah, that was channeled in 2018. Wow. It's in in the book. Mm -hmm. Yes. And for... Those who are listening, what is the name of your book? Um, it's called I Am the Light, The Wisdom of Jesus in the 21st Century. And the author name is Patricia Horton. And this book is just stepping stones. And um, I went from realizing that I went from Catholicism to navigating the natural world and really functioning in it and listening to the wind and knowing that the voice of God was on the wind and and the most amazing things happening, realizing that a 24 year old says you practice Taoism, not knowing, not knowing what it is. So when I read about Taoism, I knew how God was blended in there and why I walked the path that I did. And so when you read this book, I tried to write it like the Tao um, with passages that you can see sit with and really learn from and um, shared teachable moments within the channeled um, wisdom and inspired writing that's in this book. And for those listening and they're they're not sure how to define ascended master or Taoism, how would you define those terms? Well, the Tao is um, learning how to navigate the natural world. So you learn how to navigate yourself within the natural world. So the natural world encompasses not only nature, but it encompasses our work environment and these type of things. So one thing the Tao teaches us is how to way woo ourselves around a situation. So say you can come up across a a, a strong personality. And so the strong personality is never going to let you win. No matter if you're right or wrong, they're always going to stand here and they're going to make you feel like you're beneath them in some way. So do you try to go through that or do you weigh woo yourself around it and you leave that person standing there by themselves with their own opinion of what they think of you or other things in life and you continue on in the world learning that by moving away from such things, you benefit because you don't get to absorb what they have to put upon you. So the Tao teaches us how to navigate this world in a way where we love, nurture, and benefit ourselves, but always connecting us to um, those little golden nuggets that God leaves on the pathway for us. So Taoism is just navigating the natural world, but I allow that God source to flow through me at all times. So I always remain, I always tell people, always remained 
tuned in, but I don't remain turned on. So when I'm turned on, that means that I'm going to tap in and I'm going to allow the spirit world to speak to the essence of a, in a reading, for example. But by staying tuned in, I'm always tuned into information so that if God says, way woo yourself around that situation or don't go straight up there to that light, take the left here because if you go to the light, you're going to be stuck there for 40 minutes. But if you go here, you're going to have a 10 minute detour, but you're not going to be stuck in that 40 minute delay. Delay. And so that's part of how Taoism works. We listen to the to the um, to the voice of God through the natural world, and we allow ourselves to navigate it in a way that benefits us the best. Mm, I love that. And just the <laughs> last thing was just the definition of an ascended master. An ascended master is somebody who, um, for instance, let's see um, if I can, like, okay, so we believe in the saints, right? So let's say um, some people, you ever hear, you know, St. Anthony, right? So St. Anthony is the saint that we look to when we have lost things. So we say, Tony, Tony, turn around. So what was lost may now be found. Dear St. Anthony, please help um, me find such and such and say, thank you, St. Anthony. And within minutes, we'll find it. And so we might ask for guidance, St. Anthony, I've really lost my way. Can you, can you help me with something? Can you help show me the way? And all of a sudden, I don't know where you might be shown the way. So as an ascended master, I'll just put St. Anthony in that bracket right now. He's going to help me find my way to something because I've lost my way and I don't know how to get to where I need to be. So an ascended master also works with a level of where you are spiritually. So just like in school, we have a kindergarten teacher and then we have a first grade teacher and then we have a second, third and fourth grade teacher. Now our sixth grade teacher is here. Our kindergarten teacher can't teach us what our sixth grade teacher can teach us, but we have to go through the grades in order to get to the sixth grade teacher. And just like the teachers in school, your teachers in the spirit world will change with you as you evolve and grow. And so that's where the ascended masters come into play. So ascended masters come in all different shapes and sizes. And one thing I just want people to know, don't be so hung up on a name. Really recognize the energy that's working with you because it's their energetic imprint and input that's going to assist you and help you along the way. Because when we get lost in a name and wanting to know who it is, then we lose the message and the information that they want to teach us because our humanist wants to know their name. Oh, where did you live? What did you do? Blah, 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 blah. So if we can move away from that human desire, I need to know your name. Oh my God, I have Queen Elizabeth working with me and blah, 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 blah. But you know, what difference does it make? You know, Queen, what Queen Elizabeth, that is Queen Elizabeth. What matters is what is Queen Elizabeth teaching you? What are you gaining from that master teacher in the spirit world that's helping to elevate you here on the earth plane to grow that oneness inside of you so that your soul expands and your spirituality expands and you connect to all that is and all that you need to know. Well said. Thank you so much, Patricia, <laughs> for sharing your your knowledge. You're so passionate about the work that you do. And I appreciate you honestly for bridging the gap between spirituality and religion. So this was a very interesting and fascinating conversation. And like I said, it has me thinking and I've, I've learned so much from talking to you. I always want to close out each episode by asking all my guests for something that they've shifted in perspective recently since the podcast is called Shifting Dimensions. It could be as lighthearted as you want it to be, or it could be as deep as you want it to be. It's your choice. Well, I would say probably over the last three years, uh, about two plus years ago, I was told to take a hiatus from reading from spirit. And I did. And um, all the things that you asked me, I have been questioning and my connection to God and spirituality and how does how do I bring my work forward to make sure that the hand of God or God's influence is always present so that it's presented to anybody that I sit with, work with, read with, mentor, or teach um, that they benefit from, but they know that um, where I'm being fed, fed from is that one source of light that feeds every single religion. So you could have every religion um, around a um, beautiful fountain, um, calling upon or worshiping 
God and their own ideal. But if you looked up, there was one source, one stream of light, and that stream of light separated and fed every single religious faction from one source of light. And so how, you know, I've questioned lately, like you bringing up, like people are like, oh, well, you can't, um, you know, it's the devil's work and it's this and that. And so I just think there's a big shift shifting in the dimension and in the way people are thinking and feeling because the world has changed so much and the things that we're being fed are really bringing people back to their oneness and questioning am I doing the work that I'm supposed to be doing and am I honoring God in the work and that's been my biggest shift over the last two years and the most important thing that I want to carry forward through the rest of my lifetime. That was beautifully said. Thank you. I know that you briefly talked about your book, but where can people find you if they want to learn more about your work and check out your other services? I used to have a website until my web host decided we're not going to host your website anymore. And then I want to get all my information. And um, when we go to download it, the website was taken down and so was my stuff. So I have this tiny little website on GoDaddy. It's, it's innereyeconnections.org. It used to be innereyeconnections.com, but it's inner, I-N-N-E-R-I-E-Y-E, -N -N -E -E, the word connections.org. And I just, just put it up. And so um, watch for classes. I'm teaching at Lilydale in August this year. So um, watch for the places that I teach from because um, I plan on being out there on, on a bigger scale this year. Awesome. I have a feeling that this is part one of you being yeah. on the show. I <laughs> feel like I'm going to have you back and we're going to dig deeper into some of the topics that we briefly touched on today. This was a very interesting conversation and thank you for allowing me to go down different rabbit holes. I really appreciate that. Thank you for stopping by the show. Thank you for having me. I look forward to our next conversation for sure.